G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. Here's a dangerous idea for you. The government should be able to punish you, fine you, potentially even throw you in jail for expressing certain ideas. The crazy thing is, that is not really an uncomfortable idea. It's an idea we live with in most societies all the time, every day. Many countries that we live in have hate speech laws. The Several governments in Australia, including the government of the state that I live in, passed laws within the past two years against uh, knowingly displaying Nazi symbols. Uh, there are also pushes to ban the Heil Hitler salute. And you might think, well, why not just live in a society in which awful people aren't allowed to do awful things and say awful things? That, of course, is not the position of so-called American free speech absolutists, one of whom, although he may dispute that particular characterization, is James Kerchick, the historian and journalist and best-selling author. Uh, Jamie's been on the show before. He's a columnist for Tablet Magazine. He's a writer at large for Airmail. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Secret City, The Hidden History of Gay Washington. And I wanted to talk to him again because I saw a piece that he'd written in the New York Times, a guest essay. In uh, entitled Campus Speech Codes Should Be Abolished. This is all part of the conversation that erupted after three heads of prominent American campuses were hauled before Congress to explain the situation on American campuses in terms of the harassment and vilification of Jewish students by well-meaning, well, I assume well-meaning, sometimes probably not well-meaning, uh, pro-Palestinian uh, protesters. And what appeared to be a double standard, let's say, where for the past few years, anyone who was uh, accused of offending the sensibilities of students of colour or transgender students was excluded from the public square, sometimes punished, sometimes penalised, sometimes deprived, stripped of their jobs uh, because they were creating an unsafe space or they were erasing the lived experience of students or uh, negating their identity. And then the moment it, the tables are turned and it is Jewish students who are being asked to answer for Israel's crimes, uh, those standards uh, fall by the wayside. This conversation with Jamie is not specifically about that. I wanted to have the bigger conversation about the contours of freedom of speech, about how much speech should be um, permissible in a civilised society and whether or not artificial intelligence and social media algorithms are going to change the game on the relationship between the state and what we can say and what we can think and what we can argue. Um, bear with us in the first 10 minutes of this conversation because uh, Jamie articulates a fairly arcane but ultimately fascinating story about uh, uh, someone who he knew who is in Germany and is has been being prosecuted by the German government for uh, the publication of uh, a swastika, which is a crime. If you're not aware, Germany still has crime, ha has criminal uh, offences that were concocted in the wake of World War II against pretty much anything to do with Nazism. You can't walk down the street with a swastika on your T-shirt. You'll be arrested in Germany. Um, so bear with us while we go through the arcana of that, because uh, the conversation does turn around to much more keen and present and relative, uh, sorry, rather relevant um, topics for you and what you can say in the future. Enjoy this conversation with the one and only James Kirchner. Tell us about this German bloke who I saw you writing about, who, this American guy in Germany, who was charged, and I'm pleased to see has just been acquitted, mm. of uh, what crime exactly are the Germans... He was being charged with promoting promoting. national socialism. I mean, should we get into the history? Um, are, have yeah. We, have we, yeah. we started recording? Let's start. Yeah, yeah let's start. Right. Yeah, we have started recording, yeah. Uh, so I... Um, was living in Berlin about a decade ago, and I signed up for this script writing class with this guy named C.J. Hopkins, who was an expat American living in Berlin, who was, you know, every four years, Americans of either political persuasion, they love to complain or threaten, you know, if this person wins the election, I am moving overseas. I'm moving to Canada. 
I think this really started with George W. Bush. You saw that a lot yeah. in 2000, 2004. There were a lot of celebrities, I can't remember which ones, who were threatening to leave the country if George W. Bush won. Of course, none of them did. Um, and you heard it a lot fact, again, I by was, the way. I was counting my money because I that was the first uh, president, U.S. presidential election that I bet on on an mm-hmm. online gambling uh, site because I was so mm-hmm. confident that George W. Bush was going to win. And uh, all of my friends were so confident that John Kerry was going to win. Yeah. And I, just to spite them, I put my money where my mouth was. And I think I won mm-hmm. about $700. Ah. Um, well, good for you. <laughs> um, but, so, but so this guy, um, CJ Hopkins was actually one of the only people that I'm aware of who actually did move, not necessarily because of the election. He left in the summer of 2004. So it was before the election, but he was, you know, he, he's a, um, he described himself as an old lefty a playwright. He was big in the anarchist scene. Um, I described him in the article I wrote for The Atlantic as sort of reminding me of Jeff Lebowski because he has long hair and a ponytail and he, he hand rolls tobacco cigarettes and kind of goes on the left. That's the dude, way. is it? From the, the dude. Lebowski. The dude. Right. Yeah. Um, so he, yeah, he'd been living in Berlin for a couple of years and was teaching a script writing class for aspiring playwrights or screenwriters. And I signed up for it and um, didn't, I, I, I left Berlin not long after um to move back to the United States and around and I didn't really keep in touch with him but around 2016 I got uh he started sending out these sort of political screeds or uh, commentaries that he wrote um from his very kind of I'm trying to explain this I would say old left perspective um you're trying to be very no, tactful although the word screed didn't help oh, at well what point i didn't commentary become a screed <laughs> if someone started well, describing I think he my might writing as a rants, screed that would maybe be a point rant. which i would um <laughs> you're uh, not helping <laughs> but i enjoyed them that's the thing i enjoyed them i could have just deleted them or unsubscribed myself from his email list to which i never signed up for he just added me but I actually right. enjoyed reading them, even though I disagreed with them. He was he he's sort of a Noam Chomskyite leftist, I would say. Very suspicious of all sorts of establishment power structures and narratives. Um, but coming from an, an old lefty perspective, as as he himself described himself to me. And very, you know, from the beginning, skeptical of the capital R resistance in the United States, right? He didn't like Donald Trump. But I think he was sympathetic to Trump supporters, right? The kind of lump, the kind of lumpen proletariat, um, the the abandoned, you know, white working class. Uh, he wasn't so easy to kind of cast them off as all being incipient fascists and whatnot. And so he was very critical of kind of mainstream liberal hysteria over Donald Trump, and that was sort of the 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 gist of his political commentary. And he invented this sort of portmanteau of global cap for global capitalism, which was behind everything that was bad in the world. Um, and then COVID came along, and it probably won't surprise your listeners to discover that CJ was uh, sus- suspicious of the vaccines, to put it gently, and the public health measures. I'm sure he wrote some very uh, stern things about <laughs> Australia, about your country. Um, but he was living in Ger- but he was living in Germany, obviously, and the Germans, you know, took to their COVID restrictions with Teutonic efficiency, and um, just started writing these very, you know, bold uh, takedowns of of COVID policy. He thought, I mean, I didn't follow it so closely, but I think he thought that it was basically all a hoax, mm. um, you know, used by the neoliberal global capitalist. Um, conspiracy to distract from the workers' revolution or whatnot. This really wasn't of much interest to me. What was of interest to me was that he put his essays together into a book that he self-published. And on the cover of the book, um, which, by the way, the book was blurbed by RFK Jr., who called CJ uh, the Jeremiah of our time, just to give you an, you know, an, an idea of right. where he's coming from. But the cover Fabulous. of the book had the cover of the book had a face mask with a very translucent, barely visible swastika on it, and it should be clear from this that he's not promoting swastikas or national socialism. He's actually using it as a symbol of all that he hates, 
in order to compare the the public health policies that he despises to national socialism and totalitarianism and all the bad things that happened in Germany, you know, 1933 to 1945. Right. He's saying that but mask mandates are a fascist. Are a fascist a, boy. A fascist, right. yeah. Are fascist. And the German government, they have this very kind of Orwellian-sounding um, digital agency called, like, the Cyber Command, which basically spends all day, you know, um, searching for posts that could violate German hate speech laws, which are very stringent, or more probably some of the most stringent in the Western world for obvious historical reasons. Although CJ argued, and he's right about this, that you know, while you may not be allowed to use a swastika um, to promote national socialism, like you can't actually go out in the streets with a swastika um, endorsing the Nazis. And that's, by the way, uh, that's a policy that CJ agrees with, as he told me. There are exceptions in the German constitution for when you can display a swastika. For instance, educational texts, right? If you're publishing a book about Nazi Germany, a historical book about Nazi Germany, it's kind of hard to do that without showing photographs that will feature a swastika. You can also use it for satirical purposes. And there's a case that he that he mentioned to me, um, uh, a German satirical television show was commenting on the election in neighboring Austria, where the far-right Freedom Party did very well. And they had an image of a schnitzel, the national dish of Austria, in the shape of a swastika, right? And so that's an acceptable use of a swastika. And then you can also use it to protest anti-constitutional activities. Now, the activities that um, CJ was protesting against with his swastika are not anti-constitutional. At least the German government doesn't deem them to be anti-constitutional anti-constitutional. He perceived them to be anti-constitutional. Right? He was using a swastika to protest policies that he considered to be fascist. And that's actually allowable by the German law. And he made his case in court. They actually dragged him to court. And he was in court earlier this week. Um, and he posted his statement on his substack. And he um, this this was the case that he made. And this and, and fortunately, the, the the judge ruled in his favor. Um, but I found it an interesting um, story to relate to people, to Americans in particular, to say, look, here's what happens in countries that don't have the First Amendment, right? Something that seems to us so obvious, right? Like actually, you know, using a swastika to attack um, ideas that you consider to be fascistic. In the hands of the government, it's... Um, it's in the, always in the eye of the beholder. That's the problem when you, with speech regulations is that when but it's not when, always it's, in the eye of the beholder in this case so much because the, the guy was acquitted. He was yes, he was acquitted, but he had to go through an eight month ordeal. He had to hire a lawyer. He was threatened with jail time or a fine. Um, yes, look, justice prevailed in the end, of course. But I wouldn't want to live in a society where the government has the power to do. Um, what it did to, to I mean, CJ Hopkins. So the the I want to expand the conversation into one a broader one about free speech, especially in the American mm -hmm. context, and the difference between the free speech attitudes of of the United States and other liberal democracies. But <clears throat> if the argument is, well, what is the argument? Because you said that CJ is actually in support of laws that ban the public display of Nazi symbols. Uh, so are you in support of those laws? Like, I just want to get. Where, where we each are on free speech, or well, do you think I'm not you should be able to parade in, around with Nazis? In, in America, I don't support, I wouldn't support that. In Germany, I'm not in German, so it's not for me to say, I would say I understand where those laws came from. They were actually created by the United States in Britain and France and the Soviet Union, which were the allied occupying powers that defeated Nazi Germany. They banned political parties, right? They banned the Nazi party. They banned expressions of Nazism. Um, there was a denazification process. It wasn't perfect. And in fact, there were lots of former Nazis who occupied positions of power and, and some influence in post-war Germany. And we recruited some of them to work for us, the United States, um, in our battle against the Soviets, because a lot of these Nazis had important intelligence um, information and skills and whatnot, right? Um, look, if the Germans decide for themselves... After having waged this war that you know destroyed the world and murdered millions of people, um, that they want to ban um, certain political expressions, political parties. That's not really for me to say. 
Um, it's getting tricky now because they're the second biggest party in Germany is a far right party. That's the first mm -hmm. time this has ever happened in post-war Germany, the alternative for Deutschland. And there's a debate about whether or not this party should be banned. Um, look, I can understand banning a political party that is actually actively trying to undermine the constitutional order. I mean, you can't do that in the United States. If you're involved in plotting to overthrow the United States government, you'll get a knock on your door from the FBI, and rightly so. I just I don't personally think that the AFD can be can be faulted for doing that, and it's actually a very high bar. There's only two parties that have ever been banned in post-war Germany. One was a sort of basically a, a a group of former Nazis who had started a party. They actually called it the Socialist Reich Party. It was banned in 1955, and then they also banned the West German Communist Party. Um, this was also in the 1950s or early 60s. But now there 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 is a Communist Party again in in Germany, and that's it. I mean, there's a there's an even further right party in Germany called the National Democratic Party, um, which is much more explicitly fascistic, uh, and they have not been banned. Um, so I actually, I think the Germans have, have, they've, they've worked out a pretty good, um, balance, right. Between wanting to prevent the worst, um, elements of their history from rising again, while also protecting freedom of expression, which is something that is guaranteed in their, in their constitution. But these two values are in competition. With one yeah, I mean, it sounds like the it sounds like your general critique is that they go too far in trying yes. to in the former, rather, you know, without with disregard for for the latter, and that in an ideal world we'd have a a wider um, field of free speech than the Germans and, and than people who are advocating for hate speech laws would have. Like to take it out of the specific German context, one reason why this it intrigues me is because last year Australia actually it wasn't last year; now it was twenty twenty two. Got to get used to it, Zeps, 2024 already. Um, uh, several Australian states banned, uh, introduced these laws. And so now in New South Wales, it's uh, which is the most populous state in Australia where I live, where Sydney is, it's an offence to, I'm going to read it exactly, it's a criminal offence to knowingly display a Nazi symbol in public without a reasonable mm. excu excuse. And what's, this was look, introduced. Yeah, what's, exactly, a reasonable, what's a reasonable, a reasonable That's right. Well, well, we'll wait for the jurisprudence on this. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if it's enunciated in the in the legislation or if that's being left up to courts. Um, but a reasonable excuse, one would assume, is something along the lines of what you were talking about in the German case. You know, it's being done satirically. It's being yeah. done for commentary. It's being done for protest. It's being done ironically. Something like that, so, rather but, than. But so Hammer, I'm assuming Hammer and Sickles have not been banned in Australia. No, that's right, exactly. But then there was. So a I, lot of I have problem. a problem. I mean, look, I don't think anything should be banned. I do think it's it's interesting that they decided to ban the swastika. And as much as I hate Nazis, you know, the communists killed a lot more people in the 20th century than the Nazis did. So I find it interesting how selective they are. In well, I think it was a to response to a specific set of protests where you'd had uh, skinheads and, uh, you, you know, neo-Nazis. I mean, to be honest, small, vanishing yes. small numbers, yes. you know, dozens right. or scores of sure. young losers, uh, but showing up in prominent places in Australian cities, flying, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Nazi flags and so on. I can't remember what this would have been in response to in 2021, 2022. It must have been COVID related, maybe. I think it just came out of the general unrest mm -hmm. and sort of civil craziness that we saw, uh, you know, b throughout the course of the pandemic. And so, yeah, I was conflicted about these laws and these res and these responses. The one, one part of me, uh, you know, was raised in the American conception of free speech. Mm. And then another part of me thinks, why is it not a legitimate move for a society that just wants to be a welcoming place to everyone to carve out of bounds certain um, ideas? And there's not a. And whilst I think there are lots of risks in curtailing, in ruling out ideas as beyond the pale before we've heard them aired properly, I'm not sure how much airing you need to do of the idea that Jews should be incinerated before you can collectively conclude that it's not very useful. Well, there are lots of things that are not very useful that we allow people to say. And I don't trust government bureaucrats to determine those things. Um, and that's just, it, it's a slippery slope. And that might sound like a cliche, but yes, they're going to ban um, 
Nazism now, but that definition of Nazism will 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 expand. And we've already seen that. We've already seen lot. You know, this word fascist um, used to mean something very simple in particular. And I think it was George Orwell who said that at some point, you know, progressives use the term fascist to describe anything they don't like. Um, and that's that's long been the case now. Um, and you see that on university campuses. Um, I've been called a fascist multiple times by people. I'm not a fascist. Oh, me too. For the yeah. record. Right. So why would we, you know, you and you and I might be able to agree because we're reasonable people that, yes, these things and those individuals and those books are not are promoting Nazism. But I just I don't I don't trust many people to make that decision. And therefore, I don't think that it sh- that anyone should have the power to censor mm. anything. We have, I've been look, called, we have laws. Uh, well, we have look, there, we have a First Amendment and there are there are things you cannot say. You cannot will you cannot incite imminent violence. That is not allowed by the First Amendment. There's also defamation, which is a whole legal category, right? So free, saying saying that one is a free speech absolutist, which is sort of a pejorative, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to go around saying anything, um, but it, it's pretty broad uh, with, with some very specifically um, defined exceptions. And I would absolutely take the American free speech regime over that of any other country in the world. When I was hosting a, a morning television show on uh, the public broadcaster, I saw a deluge of tweets calling me an RWFNJ. I don't know if you've ever heard of an RWFNJ. Right wing fucking something. Right wing not fucking, fucking. Not, no, no right wing fascist. Uh, right wing fascist. You were almost there. Not NJ job. Not job. Yes, right wing fascist. Not job. Yes. Okay. Zeps is just an RWFNJ, <laughs> so you don't have to listen to anything that he says. Um, so the there the uh, there is a parallel uh, sphere of legislation which is laws against denigrating groups. Um, I assume I can pick where you're going with that one, but do you want to give us share your thoughts about you know there are so rather than merely speak, let's say I get up on the town hall steps <clears throat> and I'm not I'm no longer waving my Nazi flag um, because I can't do that anymore in in, in New South Wales. But I, but I am, and I'm not, and I know that I can't talk about how all of the Jews in the world should be rounded up and driven into the sea or gassed. But I, it, because that might be considered like an imminent threat or inciting incitement of violence towards Australian Jews. But I, I might be able to talk in general terms about how we'll have a Palestine from the river to the sea and the world and world Jewry has been, uh, has had its bloodied hands as the puppeteers of global finance and, uh, global governments for too long. And the Jews will get what's coming to them and justice will be found. Now there are debates about whether that kind of language should be permissible when you're talking about groups rather than individuals, should it? Uh, yes, it should. Uh, because again, who is to determine what constitutes acceptable speech? I mean, is talking about... Um, I mean, I'm just trying to think of examples of speech that would currently be considered appropriate or, or um, not hateful but that might be um, determined as such if we allow the government to ban it. I mean, if you talk about, I don't know, racial differences in certain um, on standardized test scores, would that be considered racist to point out that maybe Asians do better at math than uh, the average white person or something? I don't know. I mean, there's all these there's all these potential mind minefields. When it when it when it comes to this, that I mean, just to give you an example of the of the very controversial, high profile testimony that was given on Capitol Hill um, in the United States a couple well last month by the university presidents who got into a lot of trouble when they were asked, "Are calls for Jewish genocide, you know, do they violate your um, campus policies?" And the presidents got into a lot of trouble for saying that it was context dependent. Now, they should have been ridiculed and criticized for this only because they're hypocrites. Because while they think that calls for Jewish genocide 
is context dependent. They show no such concern whatsoever when it comes to, I don't know, saying that there's two sexes. If you say that at Harvard, you could lose your job. That's actually happened, right? There, are, So there's every other group in the world, okay, except the Jews. There's there's this different standard that exists when it comes to Jews, and maybe that's maybe the topic for another podcast or, or, or we could talk about that. But clearly these university presidents were being hypocrites because they don't believe in free speech, right? All of a sudden they had this newfound um, free speech absolutism when it came to calling for the genocide of the Jews. We know that they wouldn't behave that way or answer the question that way if it was any other group, if it was blacks, if it was gay people, certainly if it was trans people, they would not have responded that way. My ideal vision is actually a campus where you can stand on the quad with a sign that says despicable things, right? I mean, a sign that says gas the Jews. If you're standing on the quad and you're not directing it at any individual specific person, that would be protected by the First Amendment. And therefore, most universities, well, state universities would have to respect that because they're beholden to the First Amendment. And private universities aspire to First Amendment principles. If you're standing in front of the campus Jewish center, with a sign that says gas the Jews, that is a different story, right? And I'm just using this example to illustrate that there is context. It is context dependent. But right? the they're, fact they're, that it's context dependent to me makes it makes me feel like you're already yielding the point that there needs to be some interpretation. I mean, it, it seems like the absolutism well, of your of your position is, you know, we can't leave gray areas because these dumb, no. dumb bureaucrats and judges, unelected judges are going to be telling us what we can and can't say. But then you're saying, am, of course, there's context where if you do it in one place, it means one thing and another place, it means another thing. Well, who's going to make those contextual decisions if not judges and a judge? Bureaucrats? Well, there's a, there's a famous 1969 Supreme Court case, Ohio versus Brandenburg. It dealt with a speech by, I believe, the leader of the Nazi party or maybe the KKK, some far right group. And that was where we have the legal standard that speech is not legally acceptable if it's is encouraging imminent lawless action. And that's ultimately, yes, that's going to be decided upon perhaps by the police who are watching the incident take place. Um, uh, but yes, that's the constitutional jurisprudence. And that's that. That's where I draw the line. Imminent lawless action. You're encouraging action. violence. Right. You're encouraging violence, yes. Right. You could also write a law that says if you're encouraging the denigration and abuse and hate That's, of a group of people, yeah, and I don't and support that. Would, denigration. I know, but what's denigration? Well, what's violence incitement to very, violence? Incitement to violence is a much more specific um, category. It's a much more specific it? category. I mean, yes, I'm, I, we could we could disagree about whether or not a sign that says "gas the Jews" outside the Jewish center is an incitement to violence. I could imagine a plausible argument that it's not. Um, you're not actually telling could. people to do anything to those Jews. You're just saying we that could. in principle, in theory, you know, an abstract group of people called Jews should be gassed. Not that anyone we could, and it might Jewish also deter- be yeah, and it might also be dependent upon what the person is saying. It might also be dependent upon if there's a group uh, surrounding this person. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I I can't speak to that. But I do. But my know. point is just that that the the the, the, the absolutism denigration. of the free speech position just is it falls apart on inspection because either way we're in the game of making sort of nuanced distinctions that are context dependent. It just so happens that you want the the line to be drawn precisely where it happens to be drawn in the United States yes. right now. Yes, but yes. there's no re- <laughs> there's no like objective re- reason for that. You just like the where, where that line is. It's not an absolute position. All of the well, it's the not, things- well, I didn't look. I don't use the term absolutist. Like as I said, that's that that's a pejorative. That's that's applied to to people such as myself. Um, I'm a supporter of the First Amendment, and I'm a supporter of the Supreme Court's um, jurisprudence on this. There there isn't a Supreme Court decision on the First Amendment on free speech that I've disagreed with. They've gotten this right, and that's been under liberal courts and that's been under conservative courts um and i think that's that's a very important um fact to acknowledge right that this is something that has been maintained across decades of supreme court um uh uh, courts that have been composed of different political persuasions but i do think that incitement to violence is a much more narrow um concept 
than denigration. Denigration is so much more subjective. That that word is so much more subjective. I mean, I can just say, and I think you would agree with me, that p- p- uh, people on the progressive left have a much, much broader conception of what qualifies as denigration or mm. hate speech, or hate speech, by the way, which is just, which is just another synonym, I think, for denigration. They have a much broader concept of what constitutes hate speech or denigration than people like myself. Yeah, like I said saying that saying saying that trans women are not women would be considered denigration by them. It would be right. considered hate speech. It would be considered hate speech by them. If those progressives got their way, I'd be in jail for what I just said. I have no doubt about that because they've said it. They've made it explicitly clear. So I mm. don't. That's why. That's why I'm so. Um, and, "Quote unquote absolutist about this because I've seen what what the anti free speech forces want. They're very clear about what they want. They in the in the institutions that they control, you know, some major you know media institutions in the academy. They've shown us how they will behave if given governmental power. Right. So if you look at American universities, they are places where there where free speech principles are not upheld. Right. Where students and professors are routinely punished." and ostracized, sometimes lose their jobs because of their speech. Um, so we, ha- we actually have a, a petri dish of, of what the anti-free speech forces would do if given governmental power. And it's, it's American higher education. And it's, I would say, some American media institutions circa 2020. Mm. They've, gotten, they've gotten better. They've moved a little bit back more to the center since the madness of 2020. Um, but no, we have lots of examples of where this progressive, um, and by the way, it happens on the right too. Okay. The, 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 in, in the United States, the right has its bugbears. Um, and they are, they are cracking down on speech that they don't like as well. But I think just, if you look at most of the, um, influential American institutions, Hollywood, the media, academia, the nonprofit sector, right? Those are dominated by the progressive left. They are in control of those institutions. Um, yeah, no, they they do not subscribe to the principles that I've articulated here. And I think it's very ominous what would happen if those, um, if individuals with that sort of conception of free speech were to actually get the power. Um, it would It would be quite dystopian. I mean, don't we sort of see that in some of the right-wing anti-free speech laws in the sense that the, I mean, I'm, I'm on your page that there's a there's a hegemony of censorious uh, social justice types in, um, in academia and the media, but they wield their anti-free speech cred in sort of subtle cultural ways, right? I mean, they don't, they don't tend to yeah. pass rules. And then that triggers the right, uh, yeah. you know, in places like Florida, to pass laws against the promulgation of those social justice ideas, and those laws then become actual anti-speech. I mean, anti-idea laws, which right. I know that organizations like Fire, which you uh, you mm-hmm. know you are a senior yep. fellow at, yep. um, go in and bat on behalf of the woke to have the freedom to argue their yes. positions. Uh, yes. I- against you know to, to the great credit of um, of places like Fire. But can you just reflect on that dynamic, where, or, or is there a difference that we should be concerned about? Because when I speak to lefties, a lot of them say, you know, you you, you guys all bang on in your heterodox, you know, bullshit about, yeah. you know, how censorious the left is. When the actual real world imposition of anti free speech, you know, anti freedom of thought policies is coming from the right. Well, in terms of the government, yes, in that. Um state governments, some red state governments have passed measures uh, to that that are absolutely um, anti-free speech and they should be condemned and rolled back. I don't and know how explain what some of these are to people who I who don't follow it closely. Well I'm the, I, I think if you would look at maybe the Stop Woke Act in Florida, which Ron DeSantis has championed, um, and it prohibits the teaching of certain concepts, like say critical race theory. And the problem with these laws, I think, is that they're so broad that they could be used to um, 
they could be used to punish people who are simply, you know, teaching concepts that have long been established and, and not seen as particularly controversial. I mean, there was the infamous, you know, don't say gay law that he passed in 2022, which made it illegal to discuss sexual orientation or gender identity issues uh, from kindergarten to eighth grade, something like that. That's another example. And I, and I criticized that in the New York Times as well back in 2022 when that, when that, was, uh, when that law was passed. Um, so yes, there are two, both sides are guilty of this. Absolutely. Um, but when it comes to the right, it's, um, it's, it's state governments. When it comes to the left, it's, like I said, it's all these institutions, the academy, the Holly, uh, you know, Hollywood, and it's more subtle, it's more social, it's not legal, right? In the sense that people are not being legally punished. I don't know what's worse. I mean, what, what is worse? I don't know how you would qualify or quantify what's worse. It seems to me, just being a writer and a journalist, that this that the sort of self censorship and the culture of restraint and the culture of self censorship that's overtaken so many of our creative industries that you can't really measure that, right? You can't measure that in terms of oh, like this person was uh, lost their job, right? Or or or. Um, I mean, you may not be able let's to talk about it. Well, let's talk about yeah. book bans, this, this book bans, which I have a problem with, because there are no books that are banned in the United States, right? I don't, I don't like that term. I prefer book restrictions. And really what it boils down to in a lot of cases is, yes, most of these restrictions or bans, if you will, they're coming from the right. It's books that are about race and gender identity and sexual orientation. Those are the ones that are targeted. Um, but none of these books are 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 banned you can still buy them you could you could go on amazon and get them you can go to a bookstore in a lot of um and in some cases i should say what we're seeing is a disagreement over the age appropriateness of certain concepts and ideas so this book that is the most that's cited as being the most banned book in america it's called gender queer and i've looked at it and you know what there are you know they talk about dildos and they talk about very explicit sexual acts. And I can understand why a parent, and you're, you're a parent, okay, you're a, you're a gay parent. I can understand why parents might not want their, you know, grade school age children seeing this material. And so I think a lot Obviously, of this as debate, a gay parent, our house is festooned with dildos. Of course. Uh, absolutely. For my six-year-olds to right. play with, which is uh, right. why so, we should so never I think have I'll, been allowed to marry in the first place, yeah. Jamie. <laughs> I think a lot of these debates, what we're seeing is a conflation between um, people who le who legitimately just want to ban, who don't, who don't want young people to be exposed at all to the concept of homosexuality, and other parents who might just have a good faith disagreement about the age at which young people should be exposed to this. I think that's a lot of what's going on here. Mm. Um, but then there was an interesting piece in the Free Press a week or two ago looking at the um, books that are actually stocked in public school libraries. And you see that they're overwhelmingly left-wing books. And this, 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 there's this, the author of the piece, he went through a list of very you know, prominent books by conservative scholars and authors, and he, and, he, and he listed the percentage of public libraries that held them. And it was very, very small, right? Like 10% of the libraries that he surveyed carry any books by Thomas Sowell, who's one of the most distinguished wow. black, black conservative um, economists and really social thinkers in the country, whereas you know they all have Ibram X Kendi, all of his books, right? So that's not banning, right? They're not. I mean, are they banning conservative books? I don't know. No one's ever looked into it, right? But you know, the librarians, the ALA, the American Library Association, is absolutely an ideologically captured, progressive, left wing institution, and so it wouldn't surprise me that most librarians, who are the ones choosing what books go on the library shelves, are left-wing progressives. And you know, so much of what determines what goes in on a library shelf is determined by the individual librarian. So is that censorship? I mean, I, I, I is that banning? The, I, love the, I love the idea in this whole debate that in 2024, 
uh, you know, the content of our minds is determined by what happens to be on a physical library bookshelf, right. as if we're all in 1955, like yes. going to the library. Uh, you know, this is uh, this is somehow yesterday's battle. But I take the point. Uh, I take the point nonetheless. I mean, I do in terms of which is wh- which is worse the the sort of subtle censoriousness of the left versus the you know the legal. Uh, sort of prohibitions that are imposed by the right. I, I understand that as as kind of writers ourselves, we are inclined to see to feel the censoriousness of the left more keenly, but I guarantee that if you were hauled before a kangaroo court with the threat of jail time as a result of having published something, you would probably feel yeah, But that's that, never that, happened that, in the United States. But that's not happening in red states. No one's being no, threatened when with jail time. When you com- when you compare whether or not the like the force of the law or the force of social norms is worse. Surely the the strong arm of the state is always the most brutalizing form of sure. oppression. Sure. Yes. Although well, I will I'm say so that, you know, Donald Trump was in power Donald Trump was president for four years. And while he was president, there was never an attempt to censor social media like there was under Biden. And the Biden administration actually had its um, attempts to censor information about COVID struck down by courts in this country, right? So, uh, you know, and, and, and Donald Trump never never prosecuted a journalist. Barack Obama did. The, the Obama I mean, administration this, the, su- sued the, um, it brought charges against the Associated Press, I believe, and tried to tap their, seize their records due to leaks, right? To, to go- government leaks to reporters. So, I agree. I mean, Biden, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you raised the Biden, the Biden thing because I, I also wanted to, to raise the, you know, to sort of expand this into this universe that we're uh, evolving into in the 21st century in which social media and algorithms and artificial intelligence are <clears throat> much more widespread and are shaping a lot more of our conversations and generating a lot more of our conversations, perhaps imminently without us even knowing whether or not it's a human being that we're talking to online or whether or not the information really does come from the source that <clears throat> that we hope that it does. So the Biden case, if I understand it, had something to do with, remind me of the contours of that. It was basically about medical misinformation being spread on social yeah. media during the It was the pressuring pandemic. social media companies to uh, to ban, to basically censor. To, well, again, maybe maybe that's like the to library not, definition well, to, of ban, to, but to deprioritize. To deprioritize whatever the term is, um, or to just, prevent from appearing on its, to take off from its platforms. Um, right. What, what it determined to be medical information concerning COVID, masks, whatnot. Yeah. So this became obviously a big tricky thing for us, for someone like me to balance during the pandemic as well, because I was working for the National Public Broadcaster with a strong emphasis on truth, a strong cultural instinct to downplay potential conspiracy theories that instinct probably went too far during the pandemic. I became an outlier. I wrote an article during towards the end of the Australian lockdowns in Sydney's biggest broadsheet newspaper, calling for an end to lockdowns and saying, "I think it's you know it's time we all regain some sanity about human rights uh, rather than uh, focusing obsessively on public health." And that got me pilloried by people who said that I didn't care about grandma dying. Um, Nonetheless, the next time there's a pandemic, we're going to be in an inf- information ecosystem in which I can understand the desire for the zone not to be flooded by complete bullshit, where the only incentives are algorithmic ones for people to share and click and respond, right? Like, is that not a problem in your mind or is it a problem, but the solutions would be so deleterious to free speech that we have to give up and shrug or... Where are you on that? Yeah, I do. I think, um, look, there's always been disinformation, and I'm using I'm using air quotes. Uh, that's a term that's sort of, first of all, that's a term that's been with us really since the Cold War, um, and it made a comeback in the 2010s, and I was there to witness it because I was living in Central and Eastern Europe covering Russian disinformation efforts against the countries in its near abroad. Um, and then in 2014, they used those they used those tools very effectively in their annexation of Crimea. And then what happens? I, I saw this with my own eyes moving back to the United States. I saw this disinformation concept became politicized in the American political debate. 
And all of a sudden, what we had used to refer to as just lies, which are things that politicians do all the time, was now being labeled disinformation. And it became for progressives um, a sort of progressive version of what Donald Trump referred to as fake news, right? If Donald Trump didn't like something or the MAGA people didn't like something, they called it fake news. And I saw more and more progressives started using this term disinformation, which sounds a lot more clinical and serious than fake news does. But they would use it to basically stigmatize and label information that they didn't like was labeled disinformation. So, you know, people lying and spreading falsehoods has been around with us since, you know, Adam and Eve. Okay. Like, this is not a new concept. What's changed, obviously, is the velocity with which this um, information could be transmitted. And that's true of every informational issue because of the internet, right? Because of technology. Um, but I'm wary of all these efforts now aimed at stopping it. I don't, uh, because you see what happens. You see someone like CJ Hopkins, right? Who was merely doing, he was doing satire. Okay. He wasn't, he wasn't putting out disinformation. There's people, there's some people who might say that what he was writing about COVID was disinformation, but what happened, you know, you have these massive government, uh, you know, bureaucracies are assigned with going, you know, it's, they're, they're probably, uh, outsourcing it to AI at this point, right? To just look at articles or to look at statements and to judge whether or not it's disinformation. But I don't know how you can look at the um, record of the mainstream media or the governments over the past 10 years and tell me that they should be entrusted with determining what's information. I'll just go through a couple things. I mean, the Russiagate scandal, that was pretty much, dis a lot of that was disinformation. A lot of the things that the mainstream media wanted us to believe about Donald Trump's relationship to Russia has been proven to be false over the past several years. Well, it depends. Um, well, I don't want to go down the Russia gate. You don't want to Russia gate, I'll, but I'm just saying. That, uh, what, yeah, what Rachel Maddow wanted us to believe was false. Absolutely. But what the New York Times uh, editorial page wanted us to believe turned out to be broadly true. I mean, uh, but, we, you know, but no one, no one. We can go to, yeah, we can we can pass what we mean by my mainstream. My point media, stands, but, right? But the point stands is that there sure. are things that 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 the mainstream, our mainstream respected institutions, including our government and our politicians, want us to believe as true, are later proven to be maybe not so true. And I just don't, I just do not understand how we can put the power of the government, we can leave it to the government to determine for us what's true and what's not true. Mm. And I would I just mean, I say I that just, instinct. But the, and what, I would just say, yeah, sorry, I would just say to, the, to, to, the, to, to the progressives who seem to be most intent on this, you know, Donald Trump could be president again. OK, so do you want this is the thing when you live in a democracy is that people come in and out of government. Sometimes there's people that you like with have the reins of power. Oftentimes there's people that you don't like with the reins of power. And unless you have a neutral standard, right, unless you have first principles that you stick to, if you give the power of the government to censor things, then you might enjoy it while you're the ones in charge. And I think this is why um, a lot of progressives support this now is because they control their institute. They control the academy. They basically have the mainstream media. They don't know what it's like to have to give up power every four years, you know, every other four years to someone that you don't like because they're so used to it. They're so inured to having this unquestioned authority to determine what's acceptable within the areas that they dominate and they control. But in a democracy, that's not how the government works. So... Unless you're willing to give Donald Trump and his minions the power to determine what's fake news or disinformation, that I don't understand how you can support the government having the power to do that. So, I mean, it comes down to edge cases, right? I mean, it, this comes back to the holding up of the sign of gas the Jews in the quadrangle versus the holding up of the sign outside the Jewish Students Center. The, the devil's going to be in the details. And I... I'm really conflicted. I mean, I find myself t twisted up in pretzels about this because I share the concerns that you're articulating. You don't want to live in a turnkey dictatorship where, you know, all of the systems are in place for a party to just come in and flick a switch and all of a sudden, you you know, you find that all of the silly jokes that you tweeted eight years ago are grounds for you being having a knock at the door from the federal police. At the same time, 
there are facts where people's lives are on the line on the basis of whether those facts can be disseminated. So, you know, one fact might be who was the winner of the 2020 election. That's an important fact that has a truth that like there is a truth valence there, right? We're not talking sure, about opinion. But, so, but, and, but the legal, oh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but yeah, yeah. So let me go to the, to the more perhaps interesting yeah. one that has parallels to COVID. I mean, I am, I think about what the next pandemic might look like. Let's imagine that there's some nightmare scenario where Ebola becomes, you, you, you know, more deadly uh, or rather more dangerous because perhaps it's less deadly less quickly and you get an outbreak in a town in Alaska because someone has just flown back there from West Africa and the government wants to quarantine a portion of Alaska and prevent anyone from going in or out and you know there's a vaccination program to vaccinate everyone in Alaska forcibly to contain Ebola because if it gets out you're talking about 100 million Americans dying and a global pandemic so you can imagine instantly what the information landscape starts to look like there when you have your mini brett weinsteins all over the place talking about how this is actually a government plot and there is no ebola or maybe there is ebola but maybe actually the vaccines are a way of installing compliance among the population or they have something in them that's going to affect your brain and make you more of a sheep or i mean the whole gamut right from the most extreme conspiracy theories to just the more legitimate vaccine skepticism of uninformed people not wanting people in white lab coats to jab things in their arms does there ever come a point at which you know the public health body is able to say we de- we require social media companies to deprioritize this or to put an asterisk next to all of that and we need social media companies to post at the top of their pages the official you know CDC recommendation about what's going on or is that beyond the pale well um it sounds like you've you're raising a sort of ticking time bomb hypothesis that we often heard during the war on terrorism when people would debate the ethics of torture. Um, And you often heard people say, well, what if, you know, yes, we oppose torture because it's inhumane and we've signed international conventions. It's in our constitution that we can't torture people. But what if there's a terrorist who has information on how, he has the code for how to defuse a ticking time bomb that's in the middle of Manhattan and it's going to kill millions of people. And the only way you're going to get the information out of him is if you start, you know, uh, pulling out his fingernails or waterboarding him, right? So this sounds right, sort of but like the only, sim- just to clarify, the only problem with a ticking time bomb scenario is if it then gets misused in a non-ticking time bomb scenario. Ticking sure. time bomb scenarios are useful in uh, teasing out the edges of the edge cases, as long as you don't use them fallaciously in case- cases which are not, in fact, as as dire. Okay, but it sounds similar to the hypothetical that you're raising. Yeah, which is problem, I'm, I'm saying there was no problem with the war on terror ticking time bomb. Oh, okay. Hyper, well, we had big debates either. about that. It was just there were lots. Yeah, of, yeah, there were lots of, but it, okay. it was stupid because the Dick Cheney's of the world wanted to use the ticking time bomb scenario to justify randomly collecting people off the battlefield and then torturing them at Gitmo. But those weren't ticking time bomb cases. Well, they well, it, in some cases they might have had information that might not have led to the deaths of millions of people, but in some of those cases. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he was a very high value terrorist who had information that would save would save the lives of, you know, um, maybe hundreds of people on a plane. Right. So is torture OK in certain circumstances? I mean, I, mean, I, that- I, I think it's a nice rule to have to never torture anybody. And that's a rule that countries ought to have. Sure. But if you want to get me to put my ethics 101 philosophy like blue sky hat on then Mm. i think everyone every reasonable person would agree that if you knew that the outcome was that you were going to save millions of lives there would be scenarios in which torture would be morally justified but this seems like some tension to me about you know i take your point that i'm I'm intentionally constructing a, a an extreme scenario but i think extreme scenarios can be useful in teasing out what the edge of our you know of our print where the where our principles start to fall apart and that helps us to understand sure what those principles are 
Well, to go back to the example you said about a potential Ebola outbreak, I mean, I don't know. We just lived through a global pandemic. Do you think that someone like Brett Weinstein should have been deplatformed or criminally prosecuted for saying the crazy shit that he said? No. Okay. Why not? Well, um, I mean, there are all kinds of reasons, but all the reasons I could give would be contingent ones because they're not a, it's not a ticking time bomb scenario. I don't think he should be prosecuted for the same reason that I don't think that anybody who we actually tortured at Gitmo should have been tortured. The stakes weren't high enough. The pandemic wasn't bad enough. But I'm not the one who claims to be clinging, to be upholding, I mean, I know you don't like the word absolute, but... <laughs> you know, some fundamental principle here. Mm. I'm the one who understands that the gray areas are messy. So I could, uh, you know, I could write an entire 20,000 word thesis about why Brett Weinstein should be allowed to behave exactly as he has. Yeah. And at the same time, why I would support uh, government uh, impositions on freedom of speech during a, a different public health crisis. But it's right to that that line is is more difficult to draw in your case because you're yeah you're taking well, Matt, more who's to determine position. who's to who's to determine the severity of the public health crisis that would then I mean hopefully we the people through the people who we elect to run our public health bureaucracies I know that's not very reassuring <laughs> who performed who perform who performed so admirably in the last pandemic right that we should entrust well, them I mean the power. you know they performed I don't know about in, your country in our country they didn't. There's very, very low trust in our public health bureaucracy, and rightfully so. Not if all the public of health bureaucracy had been, I mean, put it this way, as a thought experiment, if you wanted to turn up the dial 10% on the effectiveness of the public health bureaucracy, or turn the dial up 10% on the Brett Weinsteinification of the information landscape, you would probably do more harm with the latter than with the former. Like Australia had a more obedient... Uh, and authoritarian approach towards COVID, we had 90% fewer deaths per capita. And, you know, obviously there were trade-offs in terms of people's ability to move around uh, that Americans didn't have to endure. Yeah. But I don't think that you can say that the main cause of the calamity of COVID was public health fecklessness when the places that put greater faith in public health institutions performed better than those that didn't. So I'll actually draw a comparison here, which will be instructive, I think, for your Australian listeners who, uh, who've had a very different experience with the gun issue. And it's a connection between the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. And it's that most Americans, and this might seem very strange to your listeners, but most Americans view the First Amendment in the same way that they do the Second Amendment, in that they view the negative consequences of the First Amendment. And there are negative consequences of the First Amendment, right? Like there's the, we've discussed them all today for 45 minutes. You have to endure crap that you don't want to listen to, hateful speech, denigrating speech, false medical information speech. Americans have decided that those costs um, do not outweigh the benefits of having a very liberal, small L liberal free speech regime. And they take the same attitude to the Second Amendment, by the way. So we have all these mass shootings in this country. And after every one, people say, how can these Americans put up with this? And I rem remember it, especially after the Newtown massacre, the school in Connecticut, right, where these young 20, over 20 young children were killed. And the reason I would say why we haven't really meaningfully changed our gun laws. Unlike your country, where it just took one massacre and then basically you had gun confiscation. Is that Americans view the, sec the, the negative externalities in the same way that they, of, of gun violence as they do the negative externalities of free speech. So that, yes, you know, how many 10,000 people are killed by guns in America every year. That includes a lot of suicides, by the way. But so let's say thousands of people are killed through crime or mass shootings. I think that, it's more than that, isn't it? Whatever the number is, right? Whatever the number is, Americans um, view it in the same way as they do the First Amendment, right? So where the, the kids who are killed in the school, it's terrible. We don't like it, but it's the cost that we put up with as a society to have this right to bear arms.
and I'm not speaking for myself. I don't own guns. I'm agnostic on the Second Amendment. I, it's just, it's not something that is personally important to me. I didn't grow up with guns. Um, but I'm just trying to explain to you, this is how most mm. Americans, right? This is how most Americans view these two freedoms. So you just said, you know, you had 90% less deaths per capita than America. I don't think if you said that to Americans, they'd say, oh, we would, we want to do what the Australians did. It doesn't matter to us. We want our freedom. We want our mm. freedom. And you can, you can mock us for that. You can say that we're a bunch of cowboys and we're stupid and we're degenerates and we're backwards. But that is really what's at the heart of this country. And it's what distinguishes yeah. America and it's what distinguishes America from really every other society on earth, even the ones that are closest to us. Because America and Australia are actually probably two countries that are the most close to each other. We're both former British colonies. Um well, you guys still are part of the Commonwealth. I know that's sort of up for debate every now and then. But we're very, you know, we're kind of frontier societies, we're multiracial societies. But on this issue, we're actually quite different. Yeah. Um, and I, th- I mean, and I Australia, think we saw something interesting about Australia during the pandemic, I think. Um, and just so you're aware, I have about as many US listeners as I do Australian listeners. So these sure. conversations are always interesting because I think you, know, yeah. you never know which part of the audience uh, the, the listener is coming from. It is... There are so many things, so many places to go with with what you just said. I mean, I think there are a lot of interesting points that you just made. I would just point out it is mostly a descriptive point that you just made, not a normative one, mm-hmm. right? You're, you're yes. not necessarily yes. claiming that it's a good thing that Americans no. are obsessed with the idea of freedom. I would also point out that to people who, you know, to lefties in America who say, oh, we could have just done what Australia did, either on guns or on COVID, I completely agree that it's a nonsensical argument because Absolutely. Americans would not have put up with what Australians put up with, and what was interesting there would have been a civil COVID, there would have been a would civil, have, well, there would have been. And I would actually would say have been massive been... civil unrest. It, it, I mean, it would have required a level of police. I know that during COVID, occasionally there were viral videos on social media floating around of like police arresting people on a beach or something, but that was extremely rare, and all the compliance essentially in Australia was voluntary. It wouldn't have been in America, and you would have had clashes with police in a way because the population would not have sucked it up the way that Aussies did. But sorry, what were you just about to say? No, I was just going to say actually that part of the reason I think for the lack of authoritarian COVID policies in the United States is that in the back of every American politician's head is this understanding that a huge percentage of our population is armed, right? So there, there, there are things that American politicians, there are policies that American politicians cannot even contemplate doing because they know that they would be impossible to enforce, right? So the I mean, sorts maybe, of- Maybe, but I don't think that the, I think there's so much civil unrest that can come about before the gun gets pulled out that it has more to do with an ideological difference, like a temperamental difference about- obedience and freedom than it does towards firearms because you didn't even get you know the mass rallies in australia that you would expect to get sure. before you actually got to the shooting part you know right. like there's a right. lot, there's right. a long right. way between staying obediently locked inside your house and shooting up the local courthouse or police station uh that many many ways that you can express your displeasure that australians on the whole did not did not engage in i would just say that on your point about the second amendment that's it's an astute point, but it's also one that is not going to appeal very much because and and I'm it offends me a little bit because I have so much more sympathy towards the first amendment than I do towards the second but the the problem with the with guns in America is not that the second amendment exists it's that there are lots and lots of things that you could do within the bounds of the second amendment to make America more safe with respect to guns, without breaching the Second Amendment, that nonetheless are not done. I mean, as Obama said in his speech after Newtown, if this isn't enough, then what is? Like, just in in order to, for example, register all guns or, you know, require or impose a, a truly national background check system that functions and doesn't have a patchwork of states falling through the holes reliant on the compliance of local authorities... Um, you know, banning semi-automatic weapons as the Clinton administration did. There are lots of things you could do to make that are gun safety measures that would be consistent with the Second Amendment. 
Similarly, on the First Amendment, you know, a lot of these, you could imagine a jurisprudence in which there was an overarching respect for people's right to free speech, but there was more curtailment at the edges. Like, that's not the Supreme Court that America has, but you can imagine one in which was which which tolerated a certain amount of hate speech laws as consistent with the First Amendment. So I I I actually think it would be easier. I I agree with you more on the Second Amendment and that it would there are more measures that could be taken um, to increase safety and whatnot and to reduce the number of deaths. I don't again because I'm a free speech absolutist. I don't think that that would be that <laughs> possible because I really believe in this concept of the slippery slope. Um, uh, but isn't that the I, argument that Second Amendment, you know, fanatics make as well? Yes, that if they you do, take our automatic think, weapons, then you're going to end up taking our muskets? They do, and I don't think that it applies. I was just describing to you how most Americans view it. I don't necessarily agree with all. Why does it not all. apply in the Second Amendment, but it does apply to the First? Um, because there are different types of guns, right? There's like guns with certain magazines and quantities of bullets that you can put in. And the, I mean, there's just there's a lot of technical aspects of guns that don't right, apply the, when the it comes to speech. Right, but the gun fanatics, I mean, the, the gun, I shouldn't call them fanatics, that's pejorative. Gun nuts, the gun, on them, gun nuts. <laughs> the pro-gun person can say, well, of course, there are distinctions between magazines and calibers yes. and things, but there are distinctions between different types of speech, and once you start making laws about this caliber, the next step is to make laws about this caliber and this caliber and this caliber, and before you know it, you've you know, they do wiped make, out they do make that case. the Second they, Amendment. They make that case, and the reason I would disagree with them is that speech does not actually kill people. Whereas the, when we're talking about guns, we're talking about instruments that can be used to kill people. And so, while again, I don't personally agree with this this concept that I described of connecting the First and the Second Amendments. It's not me, Jamie Kirchhoff, who agrees with it, but it is how I've I've come to the conclusion that that is how most Americans view the Second right, Amendment. Right, but doesn't they the, view it, just to clarify the slippery yeah. slope argument, doesn't the phenomenon of slippery slopeism, in other words, the phenomenon of starting in one place yes. and, you know, gradually oozing your way towards a, a more authoritarian place, doesn't that phenomenon exist regardless of whether or not you're talking about, a, a, you know, a tool that kills people or something it you does. say or a no, and this ride is, or, a, yeah, know, no. or a rocket ship? I mean, if the phenomenon sure. works, then the phenomenon works. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yes. yes. So we do have and to I'm be Second willing... Amendment ab- absolutists? Uh, say, say, say that again? So we do have to be Second Amendment absolutists if we don't want um, our guns to be taken away? Not philosophically, but I've come to the conclusion. I actually disagree a little bit with what you said earlier. I don't think that a lot of these measures that you mentioned would actually have a meaningful impact. And that most of these mass shootings are committed with guns that would have been legal under um, the automatic weapons ban. Well, it depends um, if we're talking about mass shootings, because as you know, mass shootings are right. the main source of shooting. No, they're not. In what's happened in no. Australia, actually, just to, just as a, as a brief aside, which will be interesting to American listeners, it, the, the reason why Australian gun deaths have plummeted since those 1996 reforms, since the, the big buyback, is not actually because of a reduction in the number of guns. There are more guns in Australia now than there were before the, the buyback. It was a whole suite of other policies that were introduced alongside the mandatory buyback, which were the registration of guns, the imposition of criminal liability if your gun is misused. You can't, you can't say, oh, it got stolen or I lost it. If you lose a gun and it then goes on to kill somebody, then you are criminally liable, not for murder, but for, you know, for serious penalties. The registration of all guns so that when there's a crime involving a gun, the cops can sort of trace it back and follow the breadcrumbs. So it was all that. It was actually, those things really do matter. And the biggest decline was not homicide, but as you alluded to earlier, suicide. Suicides plummeted in Australia when guns were less available. So just I was under the impression that private gun ownership is effectively illegal. In Australia, am I wrong? No, about that? N- yeah, okay. no, you're you're wrong. It's it's illegal for self defense. Oh, so you have so you can have it for you can have it if you're a farmer. You can have it if you can demonstrate oh. a need. You can have it if you're a hobbyist or if you're a recreational okay. shooter, that sort of thing. I think but in most it, cases but- you need to have guns lo- like locked up on a at a at a range. But if you're a far- if you're out in the in the bush and you know right, you need to protect your livestock. You can have a gun. <laughs> 
Right. So did the number of gun owners decrease dramatically as a result oh, good of good question? The... I don't know. Good question. Okay. It may just be that the the minority of people who own guns have, have more, more of them. have more guns. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Um, great. I'm not going to keep you forever, Jamie. Is there a final thought that, oh, I just wanted to talk about the Academy. I just wanted to get your thoughts about to just looping back to the abysmal performance of these, um, university, uh, heads in front of the, in front of Congress. You said that you should be able to say anything on campus, at least on state campus, because they get government funds. But is that the basis on which we should insist on academic freedom of speech because i mean schools get government funds and airports get government funds but we don't assume that you should be able to say anything you want in a primary school an elementary well, school no so isn't in, these are well come on there's yes primary schools and elementary schools are dealing with young children there are a whole whole vast elements of the human experience that we don't talk about in front of children but when we're dealing with adults you know people who are 18 to 22 um, I think universities should absolutely be places where uh, we have wide and open um, debates and discussions. And that means that you're going to get, yes, you're going to have oftentimes people expressing views that you might find horrible and distasteful. And I experienced that when I was at, when I was at college. There were anti-Semitic, there was an anti-Semitic speaker who came my freshman year uh, who said terrible things about how Israel was behind 9-11. This was shortly after 9/11 when I was um, at college, and it was a kind of it was sort of traumatizing, if I could use that term. I was I went to the event. I sat in the back of the room. I went as a student journalist. I asked this guy questions, and I wrote an article about it for the newspaper. You know, I developed a thick skin. I moved on. I learned I learned something about the world and about myself, which is that there are. It's it's full of people with horrible ideas, and if you're going to be someone who's um, involved in public debates and and then involved in the world, you're going to encounter those ideas. You're going to have to have uncomfortable conversations. If I could invoke the title right. of this podcast, um, and so absolutely, I think that universities should be models of um, institutions that that allow for. Um, speech, no matter how distressing it might be. Mm. Here, here. I mean, I was just alluding to the fact that I think we need an ethic of what the academy, but I mean, but the academy may be a slightly wonky word for people who don't use it, but meaning um, educational, tertiary educational institutions, what they're for, and that we shouldn't uh, ground our free speech on campus arguments in the fact that they receive public funding and are theoretically beholden to the First Amendment of the United States, that there needs to be a deeper academic commitment to pluralism and diversity yeah. and, as you say, uncomfortable conversations, regardless of where the institution's funding comes from, even if it's completely private. If you call yourself a university, you should be up, you should be up for hearing every possible point of view about everything. I mean, if not at the university, then where? Exactly. Yeah. Jamie, great to talk to you. Thanks for jumping Thanks on. Thanks for having me.